Hey, hi. Hey, Aaron. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. All set? Do you want to give your slides a test? Yeah. How's that look? Looks good. Looks great. Let's see what you're supposed to see. Thanks for rounding up some great speakers from Einstein. They've been really good. Okay, yeah, got a good group. How are you doing? Good, I've been in China for about a year. So just, yeah. Are you, do you have any, are you planning to stay for much longer? I mean, you're stuck there now, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, good point. There's a meeting in California. Actually, you're speaking at it, so I, um, I'm organizing it. So I need to get back for that. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Julia. Good to see you. Good to see you. How's it going? Yeah, good. Thanks. I was surprised, like that you actually streamlined to the YouTube. Yeah, it's for some people, like if the room is full, like, um, or whatever, they just can watch it there instead. It's like Zoom has that function that you can stream yeah. it. Yeah, Zoom has that, or to Twitch, which is another thing. Hmm. Aaron. Hi, it's long. Thank you, yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Perry. Hi. I think our our YouTube channel is up to like 323 subscribers or something like that. Julia, do you want to test your slides out for a second? Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, it's long. We got permission to leave our compound for two hey. hours. Two hours, okay. one person from per family, two hours <laughs> per time, twice per week. But and we have to apply. But the thing is, you have to, um, you have to apply for, um, permission. You need a nucleic acid test to get that permission, and then. But we can't get out to get a nucleic acid test, so it's a little right. bit. Yeah, uh, outside, right? Catch you, how how are they gonna? Yeah. Uh, that's good. We, we we still cannot do that yet. Okay. Can you see my full screen? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Looks yes. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So slide is moving. Uh. Yep. yep. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> How's New York, Perry? New York is is great. It's still here. We we are allowed to leave our houses, so that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, can't complain. Hey, Tom. Hello, Perry. Hello, everyone. Oh, oh, hi, oh. Tom. Hi, hey, Tom. You, you look pretty good, Aaron, for someone who's not allowed to leave his house. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe physically, but mentally, it's tough. I bet. <laughs> I'm doing like a thousand push-ups a day. It's like prison. It's just, wow. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, we want to see pictures, Aaron. I don't believe you until you show me your arms. Right. I'll show you my arms. <laughs> he hired me to say that. Test. He pays me to say that. <laughs> Where is this Chinese Chinese Academy of Sciences located? It's everywhere. Well, we a, yeah, hundreds of institutes. Yeah, the uh, helicopter helicopter is on the Beijing, 
uh, they basically are uh, composed by the over hundreds of uh, institutes work work with physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics, all, all kinds of topics. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, a major uh, group of uh, biological institutes in Shanghai. So we are assembled by a, I think a kind of NIH style styles. Uh, we will get that much uh, supporting from NIH though. Mm. So you are lo you're located in Beijing? Shanghai. Shanghai. Uh, yeah. in, uh, in, in Aaron, in quarantine mm. is Aaron as well. So um, another side of Pompu River. So. Nice. Yes, yeah, so I think today I'm allowed to leave my compound to go for two hours somewhere, but you can't, you can't use a bike or a car. Yeah, so you yeah. Walk somewhere. Still, there's some, there's some bikes, right? On, on the, they don't have bikes. Yeah. Uh, you can only walk? Yeah, <laughs> people, people walk for hours to get into the supermarket. This is a, that's uh, a joke, it's a new joke about the yesterday. So we got lots of pictures. Um, People think about to order some camel or something from from internet <laughs> to use for transportation. <laughs> Amuse, yeah, it's just funny. How long have you guys left? Like uh, one and a half months around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You are yeah. longer, about, yeah. Yeah, they told us it will be f so. The Shanghai is divided into the east side of the river and the west side of the river, and they said the. East side will lock down for four days, and then the west side will lock down for four days, and then it'll be over. And now it's been the whole city locked down for over a month and a half. That's tough. Yeah, hopefully we we are hoping the the May should be fine. Right at, at the end of the middle of the May. I don't I don't know. Yeah. And then when we were had locked down in California, everyone just ignored it. I just went out here. <laughs> The, gu the guards stop you, your neighbors take a picture of you and post it to, to the neighborhood committee. I remember like the mayor had a party somewhere <laughs> up there in San Francisco and then they get in trouble in doing a party. Very, very disciplined, right? So in my compounds, down. my compound as a WeChat group, there was someone posted, there's some guy walking a white dog wearing like a ho black hoodie. And I was like, all right, that's me. <laughs> Uh, uh, discipline. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You cannot ignore ignore the discipline. Yeah. Uh, should we get started, Aaron? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks to another Shanghai lockdown edition of NeuroZoom. We have awesome speakers coming up. And uh, meanwhile, um, let me tell you about uh, next week's talks. We have uh, uh, Munther, who's my colleague at Stanford. And we have uh, uh, Rui Chang from, from Yale. So tune in there. Please uh, let me and Zalong know if you want to talk about your research. Uh, we have spots available. It's going to be a great spring and summer. We'll, we'll keep at it as long as there's, there's interest. Um, but we've been um, having great talks. So um, Zalong, you're up first to Thanks. introduce Perry. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Perry Koshman. Come on. Uh, so uh, yeah, I am ha very happy to see the uh, both the uh, PhD mentor and postdoc mentor uh, both will come here to join the uh, seminar. It's very uh, quite quite event, right? So uh, so uh, Perry has uh, got her uh, bachelor degree from Brown. So uh, and after that, he went to work with Tom Schwartz, who is all online uh, in Harvard to work start on her uh, neuroscience journey. And after PhD, he worked with Kangsheng in Stanford. To start to use the CLA -CL elegans to work with the synaptic, uh, synaptic genesis molecule. So after postdoc, uh, she started his own lab in Albert Einstein. So today, uh, he, she will talk about uh, her latest to use uh, use C elegans to study the uh, function of the neuroaxons and to see the, how intracellular interaction with uh, neuroaxons and driving the presynaptic stabilization. Okay, welcome, Perry. Take it away. Don't be nervous, right? Yeah. It's gonna, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for the introduction and for the invitation uh, to come and speak at this really fantastic seminar series that I've really enjoyed. 
So, uh, so my lab is, is interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms of synapse formation. And we use the nematode C. elegans because of its stereotyped uh, development and because of the powerful genetic tools available. And so today I'm, gonna, I'm really excited to tell you about a project that we've been working on since I started up the lab uh, almost three years ago. And I wanna just start though with the most important slides by saying that this is a story that was done largely by an extremely talented postdoc, Elisa Frankel, with additional contributions from a graduate student, Arvind Tiramalachetti, and a technician, Kyrie Henry. So the current model of synapse formation, which is based on you know, really pioneering work in cell culture from several decades ago, is that it's initiated by the transsynaptic binding of synaptic cell adhesion molecules, such as norexin and its canonical binding partner, norligin, which then subsequently leads to the accumulation of pre and postsynaptic proteins and the formation of mature pre and postsynaptic specializations. And so for this reason, much attention has been paid to uh, the uh, extracellular interactions of these proteins. And norexin in particular has been shown to interact with a wide array of transsynaptic partners, depending on its thousands of different splice isoforms in mammals. But relatively little is known about the intracellular signaling pathways, as you can see from this sort of relatively minimalist depiction here. And moreover, in vivo evidence that cell adhesion molecules such as norexin, norexin really initiate synapse assembly has, has really been lacking. And instead, evidence from mammalian models has been accumulating to suggest that it may instead play a role in the functional maturation of synapses and in their plasticity. So as I said, our lab is interested in understanding broadly how synapses form, what the role, what the sort of true role of cell adhesion molecule, molecules is in this process, and more specifically, how intracellular interactions might mediate their function. And we focus on norexin because it's so highly associated with neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. So in, in mammals, norexin is expressed as several, several different major isoforms that use different promoters. So there's the full length, long alpha isoform, the shorter beta isoform, but also the relatively recently discovered very short gamma isoform, which doesn't contain any of these canonical extracellular binding domains and which relatively little is known about. So C. elegans contains only a single norexin gene in contrast to the three found in mammals, but it expresses both the long, the full length long isoform as well as the short gamma isoform. So making it kind of a good model in which to study the, the role of this short isoform. And we can make use of deletions that either remove only the alpha isoform or the entire open reading. And we focus on this short gamma isoform because it doesn't really fit in with this current model of synapse formation. So its role is a little bit unclear. So now in addition to having a simplified genome, worms also have the advantage of stereotyped and genetically accessible neuronal circuitry. So we can visualize individual synapses within with, with single cell resolution, but with the in vivo context of the entire organism. So here we've expressed fluorescently tagged presynaptic proteins in a single neuron in the tail of the worm called DA9, which we use extensively. And you can see how we can label either uh, both active zone proteins, such as clarinet or CLA1, which is the worm homologue of vertebrate piccolo. And also synaptic vesicle associated proteins such as RAD3 shown in red. And um, they can label the single axon which exists in an entire bundle, but can reveal the morphology of its individual synapses. 
So the D9 neuron makes a very stereotyped number of synapses in a specific location along the axon. And we can kind of more easily visualize this pattern by creating these straightened uh, line images starting from the cell body, working our way around. Um, and what this reveals is that there's this initial asynaptic domain followed by this synaptic domain that's of a stereotyped number of synapses and length. And so during my postdoc in Kong's lab, I demonstrated that the loss of norexin results in a disruption to the number of active zones within the synaptic domain. And in particular, the loss of these smaller synapses at the edge of this domain, as well as the accumulation of highly mobile synaptic vesicle packets within the asynaptic domain. So the, these are sort of the hallmarks of the norexin loss of function phenotype. And I went on to show that this defect could be rescued by removing local inhibitory signals that really shape this asynaptic domain, leading us to conclude that norexin may play a role not necessarily in the initiation of the formation of these synapses, but perhaps in their stability and maturation in the face of these inhibitory cues. So interestingly, we found that removing only the long isoform norexin had no effect on synapse stability, suggesting that it might not play a role in this process. And moreover, that we could rescue the null phenotype shown up here again by just re-expressing only the short isoform. So really kind of focusing our attention on the importance of this short isoform for the process of presynaptic stabilization. So when I started my own lab at Einstein, we focused on two main questions. First, whether the long and short isoforms are differentially regulated. And we know from work in Oliver Hobart's lab uh, by Michael Hart and Michael Francis's lab that the long isoform is important for other aspects of neuronal and synaptic development, including the right outgrowth and postsynaptic organization. Well, we had found that the short isoform was required for presynaptic stability. So um, since these two isoforms are expressed off of separate promoters, we wondered whether they were perhaps expressed in different neurons or different stages of development. And second, we were intrigued by the question of how this short isoform that really doesn't seem to be involved in transsynaptic interactions can localize to presynapses and stabilize them. So to tackle this first question, we generated initially exogenous and then endogenous transcriptional reporters for the two norexin isoforms by inserting a nuclear targeted fluorophore right at the five prime end of the coding region, region separated by uh, either a cleavage sequence or an SL2 site. And we made both individual ones and a, a double label strain that we um, created from a single label strain that we got from Pascalis Crezios. And um, we use this in order to really be able to better differentiate the two isoforms from one another and, and identify them. And interestingly, what we found was that in this double label strain that I'm showing you here, <clears throat> is that there's actually quite a big difference between the two isoforms and in particular at very early stages of development. So this is just showing a uh, first in star larva, L1 stage larva, where the, um, you can see a much wider pattern of expression from the short isoform than from the long isoform. And we found that um, this pattern did seem to converge somewhat later in development uh, to a similar but not completely overlapping set of neurons. But interestingly, even then, the level of expression of the long isoform was considerably lower than that of the short isoform. And we're now also using a technique developed in the Hobart lab called Neuropel that unambiguously labels each neuron with a different color combination. So you can identify the precise neurons expressing each isoform of norexin. So this is an image of some neurons in the tail. And we found several individual neurons that seem to express only one isoform or the other, as well as those that change their individual expression profiles over the course of development. 
and this is something that I don't really have time to go into the details of right now. But we've also identified with the help of Callista Yi in the Shen lab, specific transcription factor binding motifs that exist only in one promoter region or the other. And so we're also following up on how those may be regulating the specific expression of each isoform. So we've discovered that the long and short isoforms are, do seem to really be diff differentially regulated in different neurons throughout development. But to get a better sense of where the proteins themselves are expressed, we turn to a different approach. So we started, <clears throat> we started with an endogenously tagged protein fusion strain where the fluorophore is attached to the intracellular side of norexin. So it labels both isoforms simultaneously. And so this is now a series of images of the dorsal nerve cord, um, of several different worms stacked on top of one another. And now rather than labeling a single neuron, we're seeing the synapses of all the axons in the bundle of in this region. So it's a little bit more crowded, um, but we can still quantify these puncta using these um, custom MATLAB scripts that we've developed in the lab that identify the puncta in an unbiased manner and with more specificity than simple thresholding. But um, so to create single isoform endogenously tagged strains, we first simply deleted the region encoding the long isoform domains from our tagged strain. So this results in a strain in which only the short isoform remains. And surprisingly, we found that the remaining clusters were largely intact and only slightly reduced in intensity, really demonstrating that the, uh, that the extracellular domains are, are really superfluous for norexin's ability to cluster at synapses. So to create the opposite strain with only the long isoform remaining, we instead removed the promoter sequence and the first unique exon from the short isoform and then carefully combining the surrounding exons to create a seamless long isoform only endogenously tagged version. And to our surprise, this led to a more dramatic reduction in the number and intensity of puncta, together suggesting that the short isoform is actually the dominant isoform, at, at least at the worm dorsal nerve cord. So, this then led us to sort of the most puzzling question we face. So most, well, how does this short isoform localize to and stabilize synapses in the absence of transsynaptic interaction? Since you know, most previous work in, in many systems and really the prevailing model suggests that uh, cell adhesion molecules are clustered through their extracellular transsynaptic interactions. But here there's this protein without any clear transsynaptic binding capabilities that still is clustering just fine and that we've shown is sufficient for stabilizing synapses. So to better understand this, we turn back to our synapse stability assay, looking again now in the DA9 neuron at active zone localization, where we had shown that the short isoform was sufficient for rescuing the loss of these small puncta at the posterior edge of the synaptic domain. But since this short isoform still has a small extracellular domain and a transmembrane domain, we generated a version of norexin's intracellular domain that was only tethered to the membrane through this short meristillation sequence. And to our surprise, we found that this alone was sufficient for rescuing norexin's function in presynaptic stabilization. So really focusing our attention more fully on this intracellular side of the protein. So there are a lot of proteins at the active zone and the schematic really only shows some of them, but we took a candidate screen approach and looked at mutants for almost all of them to find ones that disrupted norexin's localization at the synapse. And we first tried the worm homologs to the mammalian proteins that had been shown to bind the intracellular side of norexin, but we didn't see any defect in norexin clustering in those mutants. So we then turned to what is considered one of the sort of master regulators of presynaptic assembly, especially at invertebrate synapses, and this is lipran alpha or SID2. 
And while we found that norexin clusters were sparser and dimmer compared to wild type, the remaining norexin still seemed capable of forming clusters. But we did find one protein that seemed critical for norexin clustering, and this is the PDZ domain containing scaffold, SID1. And in SID1 means norexin was really much more diffuse in the axon rather than forming these nice tight clusters. And in fact, just deleting the PDZ domain of SID1 uh, resulted in this same type of disruption of norexin clustering, suggesting this domain was really important for the interaction. And indeed, norexin has a C-terminal PDZ domain uh, binding motif, and removal of just that short motif was also enough to lead to the declustering of norexin at the membrane. So this then led us to the conclusion that rather than norexin recruiting cytosolic scaffolds, it seems like the scaffold proteins are actually recruiting and clustering norexin. So then, this result really then begs the question, how do these cytosolic, how, how do these cytosolic scaffolds localize to the plasma membrane in the first place? And so to answer this question, we took another look at SID1 and noticed that it also has this C2 domain, which is a protein domain that in some proteins has been shown to be capable of inserting into membranes. So to figure out whether SID1's C2 domain has this capability, we enlisted the help of a computational modeler, colleague of ours at Einstein, Ying Hao Wu. And Ying Hao uh, ran some very fancy models of SID1's C2 domain and was able to show that it does indeed seem to interact with lipid bilayers. And moreover, he was able to predict which specific residues mediate that interaction. So now we're, of course, following up on that by mutating these residues in order to determine their effect on SID1 and on Rexin and on synapse stability in general. And Ying Hao is now also working on modeling whether SID1's C2 domain membrane insertion may lead to more favorable conditions for Norexin SID1 PDZ domain interactions. So taken together, these results suggest that rather than, as I said, rather than norexin recruiting scaffolds, scaffolds seem to be recruiting norexin. And so this then predicts that if we were able to watch these proteins accumulate at nascent synapses, we should see the scaffolds arriving first and norexin arriving after. So another advantage of the worm is that we can monitor its embryonic development, which occurs over the course of really just a few hours uh, by its rapidly changing external morphology. So here I'm showing you the embryo developing from the aptly named 1.5 fold stage all the way to the three fold stage, which uh, is a process that occurs only in about an hour and a half and we're doing so in a strain with endogenously tagged Liprin alpha or SID2, which has been shown by Nathan McDonald and Kong Shen's lab to be required for very early aspects of presynaptic clustering through phase separation. And it reveals this developing synapse-rich nerve ring, which I've outlined in red. So to determine the onset of SID1 and norexin, we created a double labeled endogenously tagged strain and found that while neither were present at this earliest stage of nerve ring development, uh, SID1 became detectable right at the twofold stage while norexin was still undetectable but both were fully detectable by the end of the threefold stage uh, with norexin slightly lagging SID1, suggesting that these proteins do indeed cluster at synapses at different times, but kind of in the opposite order than had been suggested by the original models. So now as, just as a quick aside for the aficionados in the audience who are saying, hold on, SID2 is known to be dependent on SID1 for its localization. 
this is true. SID1, SID2 is dependent on SID1 for its stability at synapses at later stages of development, such as shown here in this L4 larval stage, dorsal nerve cord, but it doesn't seem to be to require SID1 for its initial accumulation during these very early stages of development, which is good because we don't see SID1 there in the first place. So this sort of leads us to this new model for synapse assembly and for the role of norexin in this process. So we think that very early accumulation of SID2 and upper alpha, likely through phase separation, may then be recruited to the membrane through interactions with SID1 and via SID1's C2 domain, which then functions to cluster norexin through its PDZ domain interactions. And that seems to be important for stabilizing this whole cluster of proteins at the membrane. Meanwhile, the long ice form of norexin is likely recruited subsequently for additional more specialized transsynaptic roles in neurite outgrowth and postsynaptic receptor clustering. So just to summarize what I've shown you today is that the long and short isoforms of norexin are differentially regulated, where, with the short one really being dominant in the worm, and that transsynaptic interactions are not required for its role in presynaptic stabilization, but instead it localizes and stabilizes synapses through intracellular interactions, particularly with the PDZ domain containing scaffold SID1, that SID1 clusters at synapses after SID2, but earlier than norexin, and may initially localize to the membrane through its C2 domain. And that leads us to our model that these nascent SID2 lipid alpha clusters are stabilized at the membrane by SID1 and the short ice form of norexin. So I am going to end again by thanking the people that did this work, especially Elisa, um, my collaborators, uh, Ying Hao Wu for the, for the uh, modeling, our funding sources, you for your attention. And I will end by putting back the model slide and I am happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Terry. It's a beautiful model. Yeah, it's a lot of cloud. Now I'll open for questions. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, maybe Tom first, right? It's from from <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, I'm sure Kang and I agree you were really well trained. That was a fantastic talk and great science. <laughs> so, but that wasn't. Yeah. But my question is, you started by saying that the way in which the uh, the short norexin was or the norexins were likely to work was by uh, making the synapse insensitive to inhibitory signals uh, that would have blocked the formation of those uh, synapses at the edge, if I remember right. <clears throat> so simply, I don't know that simply having it there to stabilize, uh, you know, the, the cluster and stabilize SID1 is necessarily going to get you there. So do you see the same uh, ability to rescue by removing those inhibitory signals when you've just deleted the, the PDZ binding domain? And do you think there are other sequences in the norexin short that are going to be uh, somehow inhibiting inhibiti inhibitory signals? Okay, so, a... yeah, so, so I, I should, I think the way we're thinking about the role of norexin vis-a-vis uh, -vis the inhibitory signals is kind of a like a balance of power um, where there are stabilization cues and inhibitory cues and um, whichever one is stronger at the at a particular region sort of wins out. So we know you know the inhibitory cues that are responsible for the DA9 synaptic domain are wince and they form this gradient from the tail. So we really see the effect of that gradient, but on the synapses, even in a wild type worm, where the farther away you get, the, um, the, the less the synapses are sort of susceptible to those inhibitory cues. So we think that norexin by stabilizing, by, by creating 
larger, more stable, more fully functional synapses are kind of winning the battle um, when in regions of the axon where there's still, where there's only a little bit of wind. When the regions where there's a lot of wind, it doesn't really matter if you have norexin or not, you're not gonna have any synapses forming. Um, does, but, so does, does that mean that all you need is a PDZ binding domain and a membrane anchor and the rest of it is just kind of filler? So probably not. Um, we have other, we have other projects in the lab looking at trying to understand what some of the other interactions are with the rest of Norexin's intracellular domain. Um, but we, I think that it, I think that there, there may, there may be other ways. There are probably overlapping mechanisms that do stabilize uh, these formations at the membrane. I don't think norexin is necessarily the only one. If that answers, if I can jump jump in, uh, I, I think uh, this these are really exciting results, Perry. Uh, congratulations! I'm really glad to see a lot of colleagues are here to uh, to uh, to to evaluate. This and um, and so if I may take a step back, I think you have figured out a uh, important positive feedback mechanism that is supported by the cytosolic domain of these neuronal adhesion molecules, right? So so the the, the short norexin form is basically a convenient way that you've utilized to do this. But if we can take a step back and think about you know the the potential interactions between multiple classes of uh, synaptic adhesion molecules. This is uh, would be a really interesting model because um, be, because the, the the scaffolds are the same universal group of proteins that build active zones in all synapses, right? So if you have the scaffolds can maybe initially you still have some kind of uh, adhesion molecule that rec does the recognition. But then once it started to accumulate a little bit of the scaffold, now it can recruit additional uh, uh, ad adhesion molecules to come. And then that's a positive feedback loop uh, to basically consolidate uh, the, the, the natural process, right? So I think um, this really explains this long held sort of uh, conundrum for the field, which is that in gain of function, many of these molecules has very robust synaptogenic activities. But when you started to lose one or using a knockout strategy, very little phenotype, you know, you don't really lose a lot of synapses in, vi in vivo. So I think, you know, this, these results would be consistent with the idea if you can mutually recruit multiple classes of adhesion molecules, then uh, that's probably the process to, uh, to build uh, you know, in vivo synapses. I don't know if that also goes a little. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't think that this is, you know, the only pathway um, that is important for you know establishing these synapses or stabilizing them. I think what we're, as Khan said, we're we're sort of trying to use this as a way to elucidate this sort of general principle of how um, how these cell adhesion molecules can function to stabilize uh, scaffolds um, and how scaffolds seem to, this sort of explains a lot of what we've seen in terms of the importance of the scaffold molecules themselves initially and their ability to recruit um, cell adhesion molecules. No, no David, please. Um. Did the non rissolated short form intracellular domain have, do you need the membrane tethering? Your model may make it seem you don't need any membrane tethering. No, you do. Um, the non rissolated version does not rescue. But it, did it, does it affect localization of Liprin or anything? So so, so the, the, non, the non rissolated version, the cytosolic intracellular domain doesn't doesn't stabilize synapses. So that, that's consistent with our model because our model suggests that it needs to be membrane. And in fact, that's what we see. We, um, if we overexpress the cytosolic version, we can't rescue those, um, uh, the loss of those active zone clusters. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I, I thought you said maybe they interacted with the membrane by themselves, the liprins. 
Oh no. So I think so. So I think right. Okay. So I think that what's happening is that the C two this initial interaction um, through the SID one C two domain is probably a relatively weak interaction um, that may not be sufficient for really stabilizing the cluster at the membrane. It's it may only be sufficient for kind of initially recruiting these proteins to the membrane and that the much stronger PDZ domain interactions between SID1 and Norexin are the are what keeps it at the membrane. So, so we, we don't think that it's, um, it's a strong enough interaction to, to kind of be able to stabilize the synapses just through the SID1, C2 domain interaction. Michael? Hey, Perry, great talk. Um, I just have a, a general question about what you're thinking in terms of specificity. So you hinted a little bit that the, you know, when you've looked at the expression of gamma versus alpha, um, that the that they might be in different places and the timing is, is maybe sort of the gamma is first and then alpha is second. But is that true for all neurons if you sort of follow them throughout development? Or do you think different neurons are doing different things? And is, is in those that have gamma early on for specification, do you think it's always with these partners or do you think there's sort of specificity to neuron type? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, you know, I didn't really have time to get into all of this, but we are looking at specific neurons, as you know, like DVB, which you've looked at, um, because it, neurons that have known roles for the long isoform. And we do find that it's not always the short isoform proceeding on in that neuron that's really preliminary, but it does seem like the long isoform has a larger role um, and that the short isoform is really only transiently expressed, which may, we haven't established this yet, but that yet, but it may coincide with a period of synapse formation after the neurite outgrowth of DBP has occurred. We're looking in the males as well. So I do think there is specificity. I do think that the long isoform has these, um, you know, very particular roles and it's expressed when it's needed and no more, no less. And, um, you know, it's, it's a big protein. So you don't necessarily want to waste your resources on, cre on, on creating and trafficking this, this protein when you don't need it, when the, when the short one would suffice. Okay, uh, so uh, we have two more questions from Alina, Judy. So, uh, so how about uh, Perry, you type down your answers on the on chat bar. So we can, uh, can have time to have a second talk from Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chair bar, did you say that? Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Aaron, so time, okay. Julia for the second talk. All right. Thanks, uh, great talk, Perry, um, especially in front of your PhD and postdoc mentors. Um, I remember when I gave my first talk in front of my postdoc mentor, I was trembling at a meeting and um, you did a great job. So. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Julia TCW. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics at Boston University. Um, she did her undergraduate degree in Korea and then uh, did a master's and PhD, uh, PhD at Harvard where she worked with Kevin Egan. And here um, her thesis project was to find a way to improve iPS cell uh, generation. Um, we all know that they, uh, you can make iPS cells from skin cells by four factors. Some of them are oncogenes. So if there was a better way of doing, making safer ones, that would be ideal. She discovered that and found out uh, notch inhibition is key. You could do this without the oncogenes. This is uh, uh, really um, facilitated better production of and safer production of human iPS cells. She then did a uh, postdoctoral fellowship um, with Allison Goat at Mount Sinai, where she started investigating Alzheimer's disease mechanisms and modeling using iPSCs and iPSC-derived astrocytes. She made a really amazing discovery about uh, cholesterol pathway metabolism in astrocytes harboring APOE4 alleles. Um, I remember reading this this paper. I don't know; it might be like two or three years ago on Bioarchive. I, um, I, um, it, I think she'll talk about it today. I, I'm not sure what the status of it is now, but it's a, a really profound, important uh, discovery. Uh, her lab is a double threat, both computational and wet, wet lab. And so she's a formidable uh, person in the field. So looking forward to hearing 
the latest, uh, Julia. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it was amazing introduction. I've never heard about going down that detail, following up my uh, PhD thesis paper and you know about notch paper story. Thank you so much about that. And yes, um, the update for the paper actually it was uh, just accepted uh, several weeks ago in Cell, and you know still like requiring <laughs> so much of details to get it out because it involves so much data. And um, so I'm going to talk about really a small part of that paper that I think is important. It's different, um, some novel aspect um, in terms of what APOE do. So, uh, wait a minute, let me make it smaller for everyone's face. So uh, this is brief summary, one, one slide about what we are doing in my lab. Um, we have both, as he introduced, computational side as well as wet lab side. And, uh, what we are doing is human iPS-based Alzheimer's disease functional genomics um, by taking a full genetic approach to study cellular mechanism driven by the genetic risk. So uh, I'm also part of the ADSP uh, functional genomics group leading bulk transcriptome and, and single cell, single nuclear rna seq as well as uh, attack sick data. Um, let me see, use this to uh, identify the uh, regulatory region to modulate these uh, myelospecific genetic loci. And we also utilizing functional um, multi-omics network analysis to identify the target and predict the mechanism in silico, <clears throat> excuse me. To deeply characterize this AD computational model, uh, we are performing haplotype analysis and cell type deconvolution from the bulk transcriptome, which I'm going to uh, show you on this APOE uh, project that I'm gonna discuss today. And once we identify a target, we're utilizing human IPS-based model, both using population and isogenic model, especially isogenic case using the CRISPR-Cas9 or knockout system, um, to differentiate the CNS cell type studying in 2D as well as 3D. And more recently, we transplant these human cell into the mouse uh, cell and publish molecular regeneration, uh, looking at these um, how the amyloid challenge or aging influences these human cells in vivo model. So um, I'm going to talk about these uh, AD, um, APOE related uh, phenotype that we found from the study. Um, the well-known feature of Alzheimer's disease uh, is amyloid plaques and tangle as evidenced by Alois Alzheimer. And he also reported this lipidosis phenotype showing Nile red staining, which represents intracellular lipid accumulation in cell around plaques. And more recently, it has been reported that the cells around amyloids are microglia in the AD mouse model. And these cells express a specific set of genes and called as a disease associated microglia or molecular neurogenerative phenotype of microglia. And those cells express a lipid associated gene, APOE, that may be associated with this lipidosis phenotype. ADGWAS study also have confirmed that APOE is the strongest genetic risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease, and its significance is way over the y-axis. APOE has a three isoform, E4, E3, and E2, and homoglycosity of E4 increases AD risk over 15-fold in Caucasian case. In Asian, yes, it's even higher. So APOE is a missense mutation determined by the two SNP. Um, differ from one another at amino acid 112 and 158, inducing the structural difference between the isoform. So once it's translated, APOE wrap around a lipid particles and export to the extracellular space, those are, that is known as a canonical pathway. ADG was study, um, this meta, uh, genetic meta-analysis demonstrated a significant association between APOE and AD. And within AD patient, nearly 37% carries the APOE4 allele. So where are they expressing? So it has been demonstrated that APOE is mainly produced and secreted by astrocyte, both um, mouse model and human model. And once it's activated, cells are activated, those are expressed in a microglia um, during the damage associated process. So in an AD, APPPS or mouse model of microglia, APOE expression, even in this microarray data, shows that the increase of APOE expression. And these are nominated AD risk genes. And as you can see that they're heavily mapped around a microglia or other glial cell type astrocyte and oligodendrocyte in both cases. So what about the APOE4 risk? Uh, how they influence it in human brain still remain unclear. 
So we have focused on a cell type dependent effect by the most significant risk allele APOE4 using unbiased global transplant analysis. So you, we use a human IPSL model, postmodern AD brain model, and mouse model. Um, and in human IPSL model, we will have both IP um, population and ICJ model and differentiate to the four different cell types, mixed cortical culture, composing neuron and astrocyte, pure astrocyte, microglia, and brain microvascular endothelial cell. And generating also CRISPR-Cas9 editing from the four individual with the multiple clones, as well as knockout line, and perform the global transfer analysis. And for the postmortem AD brain, we utilize a large uh, brain bank data sets, um, have mouse and a brain bank and Rosemap data. We sort out uh, 4 4 carrier versus 3 3 carrier and measure the cell type proportion of um, in this population. And then further deconvolute uh, those signals um, and compare the 4 4 versus 3 3. Lastly, to compare the species difference between mouse and human. We utilize a target replacement mouse, which carries a human APOE 3-3 or 4-4 gene in mouse, and also a mouse APOE knockout and wild type, and purify the four brain microglia and astrocytes and perform RNA sequence analysis. So about first human IPS work, uh, I would like to discuss about the genetic aspect of these IPS uh, lines. Uh, using thousand genome um, reference, we look at the, their ethnic backgrounds and these red colors is a uh, um, European. And this, the one red one a little bit down here is a Finnish. So these uh, IPS line, actually we utilize ADR, ADRC uh, brain bank uh, collecting 43 age individual. And we selected um, six, seven A.33 and six A.44 and match for the uh, balance for sex and disease status with the various uh, CDR value and age matched control. To confirm that there's no other genetic risk affecting to the model other than A.44, we confirm that there's no rare risk variants such as trump to r 47 and I also generate a, a AD polygenic risk score using GWAS Somerset and all available IPS line with and without APOE SNP. <clears throat> so with APOE SNP, uh, as you expected, uh, you can see that the high genetic risk score regards a CDR in APOE4 carrier. And without the APOE, the background G GRS are similar among the subjects. So uh, we randomly select these subjects to the study. And these yellow colors are the one I generate isogenic lines. Since APOE is not a monogenic mutation, but a genetic risk factor, there are papers reporting um, APOE modulator or uh, APOE local haplotype in the different ethnic backgrounds influencing the APOE4 risk. So I using the uh, SNP data flanking APOE locus, we identified a local haplotype in which APOE3, 3, and 4 is in APOE 3 and 4 allele is embedded comparing to the thousand genome reference. So the lower num uh, number is a more common APOE haplotype and higher number is a rare haplotype. And we identified that our population line have a diverse haplotypic background from common to the rare haplotype even within the same ethnic background. Surprisingly, when we perform hierarchical clustering analysis without APOE 4 SNP, the local haplotype segregated by the APOE genotype dependent manner. So in downstream, you are still considering that these effects in the haplotype effect in the any transform data result. Also keep in mind that when you generate an isogenic line, you introduce the allele in a foreign haplotypic background, for example, APOE3 in APOE4 haplotypic background or vice versa. Despite these variation, to demonstrate that the changes in global transfer analysis are indeed caused by APOE genotype, we create an isogenic line, human IPS line from the four individual, uh, select the two individual converting, uh, three individual converting to uh, four, four to three, three, another individual converting three, three to four, four, and two of the individual will generate a knockout to see the loss of function effect. So we have generated to total 30 isogenic line. And I would like to stop and emphasize that the unique aspect of this CRISPR system I use. So using transient GIP sorting and efficient genome editing process, I selected a multiple clone from the independent CRISPR event. So we can include the clonal variability in the model. And secondly, 
uh, to select the uncorrected clone with the corrected clone uh, from the same screen. So we can consider the CRISPR technical artifact, which in part lengthy cell culture process like taking four to six months. So once we have all these lines, uh, we differentiate it to the uh, multiple CNS cell types as I explained quickly earlier, and we validate uh, by the cell type specific marker and perform global transgene analysis. Um, this is very uh, busy slide. I don't expect you to read it because I'm gonna go through it uh, from the one hit app. So to investigate the common and unique pathway across the population and isogenic data using unbiased system level approach, uh, we constructed a gene co-expression network using the WGCNA. So weighted gene co-expression network analysis. And um, what I would like to emphasize is that within astrocyte and microglia of ApoE444 carrier, the common pathway that we will be able to identify was lipid-related dysregulation in ApoE444 microglia and astrocyte and mixed cortical culture case, which composed of neuron and astrocytes, the matrium signals was a significantly enriched, um, most significantly enriched pathway in population. And that was also recapitulated in all the isogenic cases. Since APOE is mainly expressed in APOE uh, astrocyte, I would like to uh, look through this heat map and go over the detailed finding from the isogenic versus population analysis result. So the first column is a population comparing APOE 44 versus 33. And second column is isogenic analysis comparing 44 versus 33. These isogenic combined individual one, two, three, four with the paired individual analysis. So it's most uh, strong, static, most strong uh, statistically significant analysis. Uh, however, oh sorry, and then and then I uh, look at the followed by the individual one, two, three, four, and individual one and two has a knockout versus three, three comparison. So when you look at the first column and second column, what we found is that the larger number of N, increasing the number of individual is important because the population analysis shows a much more uh, statistically significant compared to the pooled isogenic individual. Although it has many isogenic clone, but having more N show the more statistical power. Um, another thing is that APOE knockout is similar to the 4-4 as originally hypothesized that maybe knockout effect will be significant enough that they will cluster together. However, when you do the clustering analysis, knockout was similar to the originally, original individual, um, suggesting that the, uh, their background genetic might influence the uh, APOE knockout case. And this is the case for all cell type. Another interesting part is that the isogenic model revealed the discordance in a pathway. So when you look at these cases, that individual one through three, and they showed a similar pattern of changes, whereas individual four has an opposite uh, response compared to the population. And when you look at more in detail of ApoE4, ApoE expression, um, it shows that the three individual are expressed in lower expression ApoE4 and ApoE. However, it's opposite response in the outlier individual. And those show the similar response in individual three, and they express really high level of ApoE as well as individual one. So um, we do see that these are discordance uh, in these cell types, uh, both all three cell types, and it's differentially regulated. Despite that, uh, we still see the common pathway um, in associated with the lipid metabolic pathway. So I'm going to uh, deep dive into what kind of uh, dysregulation that will be identified and further uh, investigate the mechanism. So, and both ApoE44 microglia and astrocytes show the significant enriched cholesterol biosynthesis. And these set of genes are increased in an ApoE44 case that predicts to increase of the synthesis of cholesterol. And the gene set enrich the lysosomal pathway, including LAM1, LAM2, MPC1, and 2. And those genes are downregulated that predicts to increase of accumulation of cholesterol and decrease of cholesterol catabolism. And gene set enriched in a LDL lipid lipid. LDL media lipid transport, including ApoE, ABCA1, ABCC1, those genes are downregulated that leads to decrease of cholesterol efflux. And those ApoE4 astrocytes show the similar phenotype. 
And when we look at the AD postmortem brain data and further cell type deconvolution identified the APOE44 and AD carrier of astrocyte microglia both have a cholesterol metabolism as well as other uh, lipid dysregulation present in an APOE44 case. And the predictive function of that is similar to the increase of synthesis of cholesterol and lysosomal gene set, negative regulation of down lysosomal gene set leads to the uh, same accumulated lipids and decreasing catabolism and decreasing transport. Interestingly, when we compare the mouse model of APOE44 versus 33 in mouse microglia and astrocyte, we wouldn't be able to identify any lipid related pathway, but it's about uh, interferon and cytokines or matrizome and ECM regulatory molecules are significant in which. This suggests that the lipid metabolic dysregulation appears to be specific to the human APOE44 glia. So to uh, validate the transcript finding in vitro and identify the causal mechanism, we utilize the 12 isogenic APOE3344 lines from the two individuals that share the haplotype and also corrected in the same direction of 44 versus to the 33. So um, before I jump into investigate the uh, mechanism, I would like to introduce about the what's known in a, a cholesterol trafficking. So it's been studied in periphery that LDL, a particle which carries a cholesterol, are internalized through the LDL receptor binding and transport to the early endosome, sorting endosome, late endosome, and digestion lysosome, or transport to the ER. When cell has excessive cholesterol, existing free cholesterol will convert to the cholesterol ester and deposit in the lipid droplet or secreted by the lipid carrier protein such as APOE, and it flux out from the plasma membrane through the lipidating machinery ABCA1 lipid transporter. When cells do not have much intracellular cholesterol, free cholesterol will be synthesized in ER through the SRABP2 uh, cleavage mechanism uh, and also increase the uptake and decrease of efflux. So based on our transcription finding, APOE44 glia makes more cholesterol by upregulating cholesterol biosynthesis and accumulated lipids and decrease of lip efflux. So when we measure the intracellular cholesterol level by gas chromatography mass spectrometry, the most commonly and widely used techniques for the analysis of neutral sterile-like cholesterol, we found the 20% increase in total cholesterol and that much of increase is derived from the free cholesterol pool, but not a cholesterol ester. Consistently, we observed the increase of level of philippin, uh, which fluoresce upon binding of free cholesterol in APOE44 case, and as well as challenge with the lipids. This may be due to the elevated, free, uh, elevated cleave SRABP2 and HMGC CoA reductase, the enzyme responsible for the rate limiting step in cholesterol biosynthesis and SCAP uh, cholesterol sensor in a cell in APOE44 or increased. So we confirmed that de novo cholesterol biosynthesis uh, despite the elevated intracellular cholesterol level, which is very interesting. So where are these cholesterol being accumulated? Therefore, the ER cannot sense it in intracellular cholesterol level. To investigate the intercellular localization of free cholesterol, we co-label astrocyte with philippin with fitzidextrin a marker for lysosome. And this co-localization of these two appears as a yellow puncta, uh, clearly indicating the free cholesterol is uh, significantly higher in APOE44 astrocytes. And that additional uh, accumulation is localized in a lysosome. So we further identify the uh, significant decrease in MPC1 and 2, as well as LAM1 and LAM2, which are involved in an MPC2 to 1 cholesterol export pathway from the lysosome in APOE44 astrocytes. And we also confirmed the significant decrease of LAM1 and APOE44 microglia. So this deficiency of this cholesterol binding lysosomal residing protein could be associated with the defective cholesterol transport from the lysosome to ER, where free cholesterol should be esterified, resulting in an intracellular free cholesterol accumulation in lysosome. Further, cholesterol accumulation in lysosome were measured in APOE3344 microglia and astrocyte from the hippocampus and cortex of AD postmortem human brain. And we found that the intracellular free cholesterol accumulation in APOE44 astrocyte actually in a hippocampalism, but not in cortex. Next, uh, we, in a transcriptome, we found that there are more LDRR expression. So we uh, did a LDL binding assay on a cell surface using the uh, 
fluorescent conjugate LDL in an astrocyte, and we found the significantly more LDL bound to the cell surface of APOE44 cell compared to 33. However, or when we measured the uptake of intracellular lipids through the pH roto red conjugated myelin fragment, which measured the uh, actin-dependent actin phagocytosis, um, as we also can see in transcriptome that the decreased endocytosis and decrease of uh, actin cytoskeleton um, function. So we found that these uptakes are significantly decreased in APOE4 for astrocyte as well as the microglia. So further assess these uh, negatively enriched actin cytoskeleton function, and we investigate the ability of cell to attach the surface of matrix coated dish by measuring the attached cell surface area and confirming that the astrocyte uh, specific um, type 3 film, intermediate filaments uh, in astrocyte called bimentin, uh, which controlled actin assembly, were significantly decreased in the presence of these 2% lipid condition that uh, identified and utilized in the transform data analysis. Next, uh, based on a transmitting finding, we uh, examined the protein level of APOE as it was uh, decrease, showing the decrease in transcriptome. We see like a 80% reduction in both intracellular as well as secreted APOE in APOE44 astrocytes. And that phenotype is also present in an APOE44 microglia. And um, ABCA1 expression in a microglia have a decreased trend, but not a significant, but it shows a significant decrease in APO, ABCA1 and APO, APOE44 astrocytes. And what about the efflux? So we measure, uh, we, to measure the cholesterol efflux, we further label, label cholesterol by a fluorometric cholesterol labeling and chase intracellular cholesterol. So we found the significant decrease on, in APOE44 astrocytes um, in the presence of two-person HDL, uh, a known cholesterol efflux acceptor, and in the presence of methyl beta cyclodextrin, a uh, cholesterol chelator, which is a measure of available cholesterol in a plasma membrane. And consistently, uh, maximal cholesterol efflux level was significantly decreased in APOE44 microglia in this uh, methyl beta cyclodextrin treated condition. So, in conclusion, the mechanism of dysregulated cholesterol metabolism APOE44 glia is due to lysosomal sequestration um, of the free cholesterol away from the ER, then misinformed the cell APOE44 cell to respond as if intracellular cholesterol levels are lower, leading to a uh, upregulation of uh, de novo cholesterol synthesis, increased SRBP2, and increased HMGCR, and increased LDL receptor to uptake more cholesterol. However, the reduced phagocytic capacity, uh, which in part due to defect in actin cytoskeleton function, and reduced APOE and ABCA1 level, leading to decreased cholesterol secre secretion and efflux. So in summary, uh, APOE local haplotype is inherited in APOE genotype dependent manner. And population isogenic model uncovered the discordant potentially may be associated with the individual genetic heritability, um, which outweigh the APOE effect. These four genetic approach using the multiple human model and mouse model identify the uh, human specific dysregulation, especially cholesterol metabolism in microglia and astrocyte in AD brain. And in vitro study identify these uh, de novo cholesterol biosynthesis is due to like the sequestration of cholesterol which is also valid in the hippocampal astrocyte in the brain, AD brain. So I would like to thank to my group and especially Lu Kwan, who is um, a grad student heavily involved in um, this work, as well as the lipid work has been heavily done in a uh, well Cornell, my collaborator, and this amazing collaborators in Mount Sinai, uh, UC Irvine, WashU, and uh, some industry collaboration as well as my funding source. Uh, I appreciate all these help and I'll be happy to take your question. And if anyone who's looking for a position, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks so much, uh, Julia. Great talk. Um, the first question has to be from Denali, I guess. Go. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Julia, congratulations hey. on the, hi. Congratulations <laughs> on the work and uh, on the paper. Uh, very important work for sure. Um, um, it, it's really interesting that the, um, the if you sort of sum up all the, the phenotypes of the astrocytes and maybe to some extent the microglia that you have um, 
a sort of textbook um, uh, feature of Niemann pick type C, albeit in a more subtle form. So I, I wonder if you have done experiments where you test this idea more specifically with uh, things like um, NPC1 inhibitors, you know, U18666A, for instance, and see whether you sort of worsen the, um, the APOE4 phenotypes. Actually, it's an excellent question. Um, we should finish up the, uh, I still have your slide. We should finish up the lipid uh, study next together to publish great paper again. Sure. Um, so yes, uh, we actually did compare through the collaboration with um, Cornell and their actually expert their expertise in NPC diseases. So they're working on HDOG inhibitor to do the stroke screening and all that kind of thing. And we measure uh, all these lipid um, cholesterol in the different localization and all this intercellularly compared with the NPC. It seems like um, you know the NPC is more. Um, the answer quick question quickly answer your question. No, we haven't tested those compounds on our cells, but um, and also the mechanistically, you know, they are more post translating modification. And Alzheimer case is like a really decreased expression of all those relevant um, mutation that is identified in MPC diseases, and and final phenotype of these are. Uh, localization of uh, accumulated lipids, cholesterol is similar. Mm -hmm. So um, there are high chance that, you know, the phenotype could be corrected of, you know, those NPC type of diseases. But what we have tried is that the LXR, RXR through the GOAT lab collaboration, LXR, RX and Eli Lilly, um, you know, the, um, we have treated on LXR RX are indirect modifier. And in this paper, as a proof of concept, we tested on uh, LXR RXR um, compounds, um, three different types of compounds, as well as um, 25 hydroxy cholesterol, which actually uh, blocking the uh, cholesterol synthesis pathway. And we do see very interesting result in uh, difference between mouse and human. Um, we do see that the cholesterol level um, efflux is increased. So it going back to the control, ApoE44 can be rescued. And that is happening in my astrocytes, but it was not the exact same in microglia. So yes, hopefully you can follow the paper in detail. So we will further discuss about it. It's really interesting that with other, other lipid related disease can be rescued this phenotype. Thank you. I believe so. Look forward to reading it for sure. Thank you. Thank you. So Julia, this might be a dumb question, but uh, or a, it's a simple question. Um, am, should I take away from this that you think APOE4 effects are loss of function? Um, I'm just wondering if you what you, if you looked at APOE3-4 um, rather than APOE4 homozygotes, and I'm, then I'm also trying to figure out what the meaning is between the mouse not uh, sort of mimicking the human. Is it the mouse gene or is it just the biology of the mouse? Because um, I remember you mentioned that APOE4 signature was sort of like a knockout, APOE knockout. Yes. So you actually asked two questions and it's very confusing question actually in the field because I always all getting question about you know, the David Holtzman have shown that yes. you actually specifically remove APOE in astrocyte, actually removing a uh, toxic effect. So do, in the therapeutic perspective, do we have to go that route? Yes, in a human, from my data showing that APOE knockout is similar to the APOE44 uh, APOE case. Yes, in a pure cell type. So- um, But he would say that, he, but his, I, my interpretation of his paper is that he would, say you want to target APOE4 in astrocytes. And I, th I think your talk is saying that APOE4 in astrocytes is like a loss of function. So I'm, that's why I'm confused. APOE has a loss of function as well as also gain of toxic function as well. Because so it has the lipid dysregulation as well as the part that I didn't present is that it generates like a pro-inflammatory prime state that actually augment the matrix problem. So it's paper is about really cholesterol and matrizome pathway. So matrix problem of uh, enriched matrizome uh, presence that in the APOE, 
ApoE4 for astrocyte when we interact with neuron. So ApoE um, have a loss of function and huge gain of toxic function, I think, has both present. So I know it's complicated. So in a um, mouse case, so, in, so it's, we still need to further investigate into context of non-cell Thomas effect. So to answer your second question about mouse and human. So mouse and human gene, mouse gene versus human gene of ApoE has 70% homology. And what we originally assume is that, you know, these hoping that these isogenic, creating isogenic behaving like a Mendelian mutation case of uh, genetic, genetic factors, right, mutation. However, what we found is that one of the individuals and some individual uh, CRISPR edited lines do not behave the population uh, model. So it, when we start looking at the promoter and enhancer region, probably these other uh, cis regulatory elements might regulating the APOE effects. And even APOE expression level is you know, going in an opposite direction, as I showed briefly. And when you look at the mouse versus human progenitors or enhancer region, progenitor region, and this regulatory element has only 40% homology. So uh, further dig into the literature that um, APOE, lower expression identifying APOE4, those mRNA expression downregulation are not present in mouse case, mouse model study. So that's- I, I see, yeah. Okay, so, okay, got it. So. Because some people like Holtzman and uh, Yadong, Huang, and stuff mm -hmm. make knock-ins of the human into the mouse, but I guess that doesn't capture all of the regulatory regions and, and things. Correct. Um, so, so it's just we place the yeah exonal region and not a promoter region or enhancer. We don't really have in study. So my regulating different way. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, John, you're up. Thank you. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, I, one question I have is um, if you could apply um, recombinant APOE4 uh, or APOE3 in the medium to one control line, would you see the same effect in a cholesterol pathway? I'm wondering whether effect of APOE is all through um, um, as, a, as, a, as a, a secreted molecule or it has something directly in a cell autonomous way within the cells. Uh, we haven't administered any external APOE. So these are the uh, cell, looking at the cell autonomous effect. And there are in a mouse model study, they have been looking at uh, adding recombinant APOE or uh, yeah, common APOE and how they're responding uh, in a cell. But um, what I could assume is that if you add, add external lipid, still there are some uh, defects in uptakes of um, lipids from external space and still like uh, endogenously produced APOE along with other lipid will be probably accumulating in the cell. So what we have looked at is an inter, uh, just a pure um, endogenous type of uh, phenotype. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Omkar, question. Uh, hello, Dr. CW, uh, great talk. My apologies if you already answered this. Um, but why did the concordant and discordant patterns emerge in the population isogenic models that you showed earlier? Why do I think they are? <laughs> it was actually a surprise. We ex expected that they're supposed to be behaving same way of um, population study. Like as a lot of isogenic study have shown in a monogenic case, like Mendelian mutation case that, yeah. you know, people publish a paper with one corrected clone with uncorrected clone. That's why we have so many isogenic line and we actually studying genetic risk variant, not the monogenic, the, this, not the uh, um, Mendelian mutation case. It's penetration is not hundred percent. And we didn't expect that one individual is behaving out as an outlier. And it was right. surprised that the outliers are not even the same person in all different cell types. So in, when you go in a different differentiation stage, each um, you know, regulatory element of the human genome is regulating that particular cell type and particular individual in different manner. So um, 
just wanted to um, you know address about these uh, how to model these genetic risk, not the uh, um, Mendelian mutation case using IPS model. And yes, that has to be further investigate that how and why this individual um, having opposite response compared to any other individual. And we screen for any rare mutation, known AD uh, rare high risk mutation. They don't carry none of this. And further maybe need to identify uh, by the plexic or something and how which SNP is regulating a particular individual um, to fit, uh, tease apart that why that happened. But um, it presum presumably uh, APOE local haplotype influences the APOE risk. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. And this is the question I ask at all the, just because I don't know all, all the APOE talks is, have you tried or thought about trying like some of these very rare, ultra rare protective variants in, in APOE, um, you know, just to see if in your WGCNA thing or other, if, if the signature mimics like a loss of function or gain of function or something. I, I wonder if that's informative. Yes, absolutely. That's one of the projects I'm working on in my lab. And honestly, it took for me to, that's the next thing I would like to publish another cell paper like this in the uh, population and nitrogen model. Because uh, um, yes, uh, one question is that would we adding uh, protective variant, APOE2, Christchurch, and Jacksonville mutation, would we adding this in APOE4 background could rescue the phenotype? I don't think we even understand what does APOE do in this manner and all this, what kind of specific pathway hit it when you have enough APOE2 case or even Christchurch and Jacksonville mutation because it's hard to model it um, because it's so hard to identify the homozygosity of those uh, rare variants. Um, but like in a population of uh, APOE, even APOE4, it took time to identify um, four four carriers and all the Caucasian background with age match and all this kind of phenotype and Al Alzheimer case. And I have put in quite a lot of effort to identify this APOE2 case and we probably be able to address um, in next few years working on an APOE2 and see what, what it does. And that that's what it's ongoing project. That's a great cool. question. Cool. All right. Thanks, Julia, for presenting the latest. It's really exciting and provocative. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in again. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. Awesome talk. Thank See you. See everyone next, next Thanks, week. Everybody.